21, studying the first 11 verses there. And my message this morning is entitled Crowd Noise. And, and the crowd surrounding Jesus, it reminded me of, of sporting events. I mostly think of football. I mean, t- today they, they play in front of some massive crowds at the professional or, or the big college level. And, and that takes some getting used to. I mean, the, in our day-to-day lives, we're not used to thousands and thousands of people shouting at us. That in, in some practices, they've even taken to, they call it pumping in, playing this noise to get people ready to, to play in front of it. And, and, and when you're the home team, you, you try to encourage that, to get people to, to make some noise for, for your benefit. But unfortunately, if you've been part of that, there, there's a lot of people that make a lot of noise, do a lot of yelling. They don't necessarily know what's going on on the field there. They're, they're shouting and yelling, but it's not especially productive. They don't know what they're talking about. But, but when you're in the midst of that, you get caught up in it. I mean, it's, it's just so easy to, to, to yell and, and kind of get carried along with that. And I think that's really what we see here today with, with the crowds outside of Jerusalem during Christ's triumphal entry. It, it, there must have been an almost deafening sound as they're praising and, and yelling for him. And, and, and we're going to look at the words here in verse 8 that they were proclaiming. And these were true. These were things that God wanted to be proclaimed. It was the necessary message that their Messiah had arrived. But unfortunately, as we look to the end in, in verse 11, then we're going to see that I, I believe many of them knew not what they were saying. They didn't have a full understanding. They just got kind of caught up in it all, and it, it didn't leave a, a lasting impact in their lives. And as is often said, I'm afraid so many that said Hosanna and, and praise to Christ were later that week shouting, crucify him, crucify him. So let's turn together to Matthew 21, starting in verse 1. And if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 21, 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting on an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes then went before, and that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Let's pray together. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Scripture, Lord, and the truth that you give to us. We thank you for this record of Christ offering himself as Messiah. We thank you that he came, what he did for us. We thank you for everything that's happened so far in our service. And I ask that you would just be with me as I share your word. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you give and do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And I do thank each one who took part in our service this morning. I thank you all for being here and for sharing in the singing And as we look at these 11 verses, we're going to consider first the plan of entrance, then we're going to see the prophetic explanation, and third, we'll see the people's error. Now remember, leading up, this is Passover week. So this is is a very key time in the Jewish calendar, and it's estimated there might have been 2 million people around Jerusalem at this time. So we're, we're talking about a serious crowd here. They're celebrating the feast, they're going to the temple, and we saw last Sunday night how about six months before this, Christ knew it was going to be his time, and he set his face towards Jerusalem. He was up in Galilee, but he knew it was time for his final journey there. He knew it was necessary to go to the cross. And, and now this is him finally coming. He's arrived at the, at the capital, the holy city of Jerusalem. And, and, and as he rides in, and we're going to look at the prophecy, this is him offering himself as Messiah. So often during his earthly ministry, he'd heal somebody, and he said, shh. Don't don't tell people how this was done. Don't tell people uh, who I am. Now he knows the time has come and he's offering himself to the Jewish people. Unfortunately, they will not receive him. So in the first three verses, we see first his plan of entrance. 
Verse 1, and they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives. So uh, if we back up before in, in 2024 or 2029, we see, and as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. So this was that journey Christ took. He, he went, he, he was not admitted into some of the Samaritan villages, so he didn't come straight down to Jerusalem. He passed over to the eastern shore of the Sea of Gal or of the Jordan River, came on down south through Perea, and now we see it's just like the children of Israel, they crossed over the, the Jordan River to get to Jericho. That's what Christ did. He came to Jericho, he healed the two blind men, and now he's finally approaching Jerusalem for the last time. As, as I said before, he had gone to Jerusalem before, but, but this time was different, this time was special. And he had finished this deliberate six-month journey, he got to Jericho, and now between Jericho and Jerusalem, it's about a 17-mile journey, and, and it's a rough trip. Jericho, I mean, the, the, the Jordan River is all below sea level, so that's way low. Jerusalem's up in the mountains, so it's about 17 miles. You're gaining about 3,000 feet of elevation, so it was a tough hike to get up there. Uh, this is the setting of the story of the Good Samaritan, where the Jewish man got waylaid on the, on the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this was a, a rocky path. It was, it was full of robbers, so, so it wasn't easy. And then the night before, so after he, he came from Jericho, the, the, the Sabbath night before his triumphal entry, he stopped at Bethany. He spent time, we see in the other Gospels, with, with Mary and, and uh, Martha and Lazarus. That's the time where Mary anointed his, his head and his feet in preparation for his, very, his burial. And he would not stay the night in, in Jerusalem. Every evening he would walk these couple of miles back to Bethany and spend the night with them. So he was in Bethany, now he leaves Bethany, and that's where we pick up here. He drew nigh unto Jerusalem and was come to Bethpage. So Bethpage is, is just kind of a little north, uh, northwest of Bethany, and, and it's kind of on the, the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. So he'd come near Bethany, come up over the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley, and coming into Jerusalem. So it's like he was staying at State Line, he passed through Bushtown, and then was getting on up into Greencastle. So some people know where Bushtown is, that's good, so... Uh, so, so this is his, his journey, and that's why I want to make clear, so it was about two miles here that he was going to journey from, from the Mount of Olives down into Jerusalem then. And he entered Jerusalem before, but he probably took a different route. He probably kind of came in the side door into the Sheep Gate. He, he didn't make a fuss. He, he often, he didn't want it to be known he was there until he was ready to present himself. So this was going to be a very different entrance. And I found it interesting that, that this Sunday here, this is the day that the Paschal Lamb was set aside. So the lamb your family is going to use for the Passover, this is the day you, you pick it, you, you get him out of the flock, and you set it aside. And of course, this is the, the day the Lamb of God is coming into Jerusalem. So we say, so, so Christ is there, he's ready to head towards Jerusalem, and he, he sent two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, that would be Bethpage, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. So he had need of this colt. He, he's, he's got two disciples, two of them, it doesn't say which two, and he's commanding them to, to get what he needs to make ready for his final journey. And, and he's extremely specific. He says there's going to be a, a mother donkey and, and her child or, or yearling male donkey. These are the two you're supposed to get. He was even clear that it was going to be at a, at a crossroads. Th that, this is what I want. And, and the other Gospels make clear that, that the colt, he, he, was, he was unbroken. He'd never been ridden. He hadn't been broken and made ready to be a beast of burden yet. Matthew is the only one that tells us about both animals. All the others refer to, to just the colt, but they brought the mother with them as well. Uh, in part, that's because, and we'll look at the prophecy in the next part, that, that it talks about an ass and the colt, the foal of an ass. Really, that, that's just two descriptions of the same animal, but some read that literally and, and decided they needed both animals. But I think the disciples needed the mother, that you weren't going to lead around an unbroken donkey without a little help. So, so the disciples needed to take the mother with them so that the colt would follow along and they could be able to handle him. Jesus didn't need the donkey to ride on. It, it was two miles. I mean, this was a man that had walked over the length and breadth of the Holy Land. Um, and and I've, I've spoken with people who've been to the Holy Land. They said, if you've walked over there, you know Jesus was no wimp. 
that, that the, his, his hometown of Nazareth was down in a valley. If you were getting anywhere, you were going uphill. So they said he, he, he must have been in decent shape to be doing the walking he did. So, so he wasn't tired, he wasn't worn out and said, hey, I need something to ride on. It was all to fulfill this prophecy that he was bringing in, and, and bringing in this colt to ride. It was fulfillment. And it, it's, a little, it's, it's a small donkey. It's, it's not something special, it's not something amazing, but it is central to, to this key passage of Scripture. Christ can use menial things. Christ can use small things. Christ can use simple things to the glory of God. He can use us. He can use our lives, regardless of what your gift is, regardless of you say, well, I'm not special. As far as we know, there was nothing special about this donkey. It wasn't purebred. It wasn't super duper. But it was there and meat for the use of Christ. And so that, that we, we need to be just ready to say, Lord, whatever I've got, whatever, however small it might be, use me as you see fit. And then in verse 3, he, he's told them they, they're going to find them. He's going to tell them where to find them. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him. Christ knew the future. And, and some say that Christ had this worked out with this guy beforehand. I don't think so, because Christ hadn't been in this area for quite some time. I, I think it was just him miraculously knowing how things were going to be and, and working as God. And, and, and I hadn't thought about it, but, but Pastor Herm's message reminded me, and I'd like to turn to Luke 22, and, and just a few verses before where we looked at the Passover. Luke 22, verses 7 to 13, where we see the preparation for the Passover. And it's a very similar thing to what we see here in getting the donkey ready. In Luke 22, 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed, and he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready." And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Christ, Christ was still God. He, he had miraculous knowledge. He could see that room. He could perfectly clearly see the donkey, and, and he could work in the heart of the owners there. It, it reminds me of some people, they've got offices, and it might look disorganized to you, but they, but they know everything that's there. That They'll say, oh yeah, you need that file. It, it's on the front right corner of my desk. It's like the third thing down, blue folder. It's on the left-hand side. They, they've got it all figured out. And, and that's Christ to the whole world. He knows the hairs on our head. He knows if, if one sparrow falls out of the sky. He, he can see it all. So Christ miraculously knew this and miraculously worked it all out. It's important for us to remember that, that Christ was in total control through his whole earthly ministry. He was, he was man, but he was still God. There was not one thing that happened that was outside of his will. It was in his power. And then I like when it says, The Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him. We don't know that this man was a disciple or anything, but, but the Lord hath need of him. So Christ is not, and I put in quotes, he's not merely the Lord of our lives because we're believers. He, 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 he is our Lord, he should be, but he's still Lord of everything. He's still Lord of creation. Whether us, others want to own him or not, he's their Lord. And the time is going to come where they're going to have to admit that, they're going to have to bow the knee and proclaim his lordship. So he's the Lord of all creation here, the Lord hath need, and this man's going to send the donkey that he needs. And, and if we jump to verse 6, we see, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. By faith, the disciples did exactly as commanded, and Jesus took care of the details. You've got to think, they, they're just wandering into Bethpage, hoping to come across a donkey somewhere, but they said, the Lord said that we were to do this, this is what we're going to do, and Christ took care of the details. So we don't need to... When Christ gives us something, we're like, how's that going to work out, Lord? Or that seems kind of odd. We just need to follow by faith, leave, leave the rest, leave the things outside of our control up to him. Now in verses 4 to 7, we see the prophetic explanation. Why on earth is Jesus hopping on top of a, a colt to ride into Jerusalem here? And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, behold, the king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the full of an ass. Christ, Christ knew the scripture fully. 
And of course he knew it because he was God, but I think he was a student of the Scripture. We, we see him spending time in the synagogues with the rulers, with the teachers. I think he was a student of Scripture. So he knew all the prophecies that were going to be fulfilled in him and exactly how they went. And so he was going to fulfill them to the most minute detail. Now when it talks, tell you the daughter of Sion, some people say part of that came a little bit from Isaiah 62.11, but most of this comes from Zechariah 9.9. So if we want to look at Zechariah 9.9, we'll see this laid out for us. Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Sion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. That's that's pretty clear, isn't it? He's going to come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. That that, that lays it out. There's some of the prophecies that you kind of need an explanation for or kind of hard to see. That that one's pretty right on the face there. Messiah is going to appear. He's going to be lowly. And and then as we go down through the rest of of chapter 9, it's talking about the future deliverance of Judah and Ephraim. That that he's going to come, he's going to save them from their enemies, and he's going to set up his kingdom. And and even today, Jews read this and they'll say, yeah, that's a messianic prophecy. That's how the Messiah is going to come. But they missed it with Christ here. And Many talk about how he entered. I believe he entered through the east gate because that would have been the most direct route from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. Would have taken him right to the temple. And there's also some prophecies about the east gate if we turn to Ezekiel. If we turn back to Ezekiel 43. Ezekiel 43, 1 through 5. And in early year, earlier in the prophecies of Ezekiel, he saw the glory of the Lord departing from the temple. He, he saw the glory of the Lord. It was in the Holy of Holies where, where, where it had been. And, and because basically the, the people had rejected him, they've gone to idolatry. He saw it pass out outside to the doorstep. Then he saw the glory go out, over the, out through the east gate and over to the Mount of Olives and away. And now this is, praise the Lord, this is the return of the glory of God. And Ezekiel 43 verse 1. Afterwards he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh towards the east, so it faces the Mount of Olives. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on the face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house, By the way of the gate, whose prospect is towards the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. Christ Jesus, God in the flesh, he came through the east gate. He came in and he entered the temple. So God was once again in the temple, but again, he was rejected by his people. So it did not fully fulfill this prophecy. This this is going to be yet future because it's it's been postponed because Israel... Israel rejected their Messiah. We see Ezekiel have a little bit more to say in verse uh, in chapter forty four, verses one to three. Then he brought me back the way of the gate outward, the sanctuary, looked towards the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut; it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the way of the same. The east gate is shut up today. And and that shows that this is obviously a messianic prophecy because even the Muslims understood that. That when they took control of Jerusalem, they they shut up the east gate. Of course, it was all destroyed in 70 AD. It was rebuilt. They they shut up this gate. They built a... uh, a cemetery there, so, so obviously the clean Messiah wouldn't come through there. So some people argue whether it's shut today because Christ already came, or if this is yet future, that when the Lord's going to come back and he'll come through there, and then, then the prince in the millennium. But, but obviously there's, there's something special about this east gate and somebody that's going to come through there. And so if the people have been thinking about it, the people are looking, there, there's obviously something special going on here. But I want to look back at Zechariah 9.9, look back at the direct prophecy we're fulfilling here, because we'll notice that Matthew 
he doesn't record the whole thing. He only records part of it. Zechariah 9.9. 9. And so we've, as we look there, we compare that to, uh, to verse 5. Behold the king. We've got that part. We've got the part about the king being meek and the animal he's riding on. So that all matches right up. But Matthew does not, he doesn't add the part about rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. And he doesn't add the part of he is just and having salvation. And of course, that's by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that again, this wasn't all perfectly fulfilled because Israel rejected their Messiah. So, so they rejected. He came with salvation, but they rejected the salvation that he brought there. He, he came and he could have brought rejoicing, but they rejected them. And so as we'll look tonight, instead of bringing rejoicing, Jesus wept over the city. So by the Holy Ghost, the, 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 the fulfillment of prophecy is perfect here, but it's split. It reminds me of Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21, when, when Christ is reading in the synagogue, and, and he says, this is fulfilled in your ears, and he's reading a prophecy of himself, and he stops mid-sentence because it's the split of the two advents. It talked about him coming, but then it talked about the, the day of his judgment, the day of his, his vengeance, and that wasn't come. So, so he stopped and didn't read that because he hadn't yet fulfilled it. And that's what we see here. We see that this has in part been fulfilled, but yet we know in the future Christ will come. He will bring rejoicing to the nation of Israel. He will bring salvation to them as well. We've looked at all this prophecy, and it seems so clear to us looking back on it, but let's look at how the disciples and what the disciples' view was in John 12. As John recounts it in John 12. John 12:16. 12, Before this goes John's account of the triumphal entry. It talks about Christ, it talks about the palm branches, the, the people proclaiming, it talks about the prophecy and the donkey, but in verse 16 these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. So the disciples didn't put it all together. It, it, it's, it's clear there to be understood, but they didn't get it. And so I think that means probably most of the people saying these things, they didn't put it all together either. It, it wasn't until later. Now, if there's one group that should have realized the fulfillment of prophecy... It should have been the religious leaders, the scribes. And I think they got it. And we're going to look at that a little bit later because they realize what Christ is claiming here. But of course, they were going to reject him. They were going to fight him on it. So this is the prophecy. We see, the king cometh unto thee meek. Meekness is the byword of Christ on this earth. Like I said, he was God. He had all power. Nothing was outside of his control. But he willingly made himself subject to the, the frailties of humanity. He willingly... Uh, veiled the, his glory and, and, and gave up some of the prerogative of his power and authority. He wasn't asserting his own right. He wasn't asserting his own power. This king is going to come into Jerusalem. He's not a conquering king. He, he's not coming to, to demand allegiance. He's not saying, I'm the ruler, come kiss my ring sort of thing. He's, he's coming meek and lowly to be welcomed by his people. And ironically, to be, to be riding on a donkey, that was a step up for Christ compared to what we see in most of his ministry. He, he walked everywhere else as far as we knew. And when it talks about him going back and forth, on the, it, it calls it a ship on the Sea of Galilee, but it was an open fishing boat. It, it was no luxury yacht. It was an open boat, waves splashing in, the wind catching you. So, so he was certainly not used to the finer things. He, he was meek. Just, just such humility. And even here, he's riding on a borrowed donkey. He didn't even pick one up, he, he, did, he didn't buy one. E even poorer people, even if they didn't have a home, a lot of them would have a donkey to carry possessions or, or to use. He didn't even have a donkey to his name. The, the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. He didn't even have a beast. And how far out of step this is with the, with the pride and, and the avarice we see of, of leaders today, of of national leaders and at all levels, but, but even of some churches, how concerned we are with how things look and, and keeping up appearances and things being nice. The Lord who were to be following was meek and he was lowly. Somebody asked Corey Ten Boom uh, how she stayed humble. And of course, she, she in her youth, they had, they had hidden Jews during the Holocaust and they were caught for this and she went to a concentration camp. 
And by God's providence, she survived. She, she wrote the book, The Hiding Place, and became a very popular speaker. She, she gained a lot of fame, and a lot of people respected her. And somebody said, how, how do you stay humble through all this? And she looked back to, to this passage, and she says, when, when Christ was entering Jerusalem, and the, and the crowds were, were praising him and, and saying how wonderful he was, she said, do you think it ever entered the donkey's head that some of that was for him? And she said, that, that's all I am. I'm just a tool of the Lord. He, he has seen fit to use me to carry forth his ministry. It's not for me. It's for him. If, he's hum, if he works and lives in humility, how much more humble, how much more lowly should we ourselves be? So he came riding on a donkey. Well, well why a donkey? A donkey is an animal of peace. A donkey is an animal for, for work and bearing burdens. It's not a war horse. It's not a conquering animal. And the Israelite kings, they were, they were commanded not to multiply or, horses. They weren't to have a big uh, stock of horses and chariots because that would cause them to rely on their own strength. They were to, to rely on God for their protection. So, so in light of that, donkey would be a, an appropriate animal for the king of the Jews to ride upon. And in earlier centuries, they, they listened to that. The, ju the judges, they rode on donkeys, especially many of them had white donkeys to, to show the, the, the purity there. Uh, and, and up to the time of Solomon, the donkey was the animal to ride on. But, but after that, when the, the monarchy grew and, and wealth, and then all the kings thought they, they needed their stables, they needed their horses. So by this time, it, it was generally for, for just the impoverished people to ride on, or, or it was for, for a beast of burden. And I didn't study it out super closely. I don't think it says anywhere in Scripture that, that Mary rode a donkey, but that seems to be the way she and Joseph are always depicted. Coming down to Bethlehem, she, she's, she's on a donkey because, as we know, they were poor. But it was largely a beast for burden. And as we said here, that this is a yearling donkey, not, not broken, not trained, never been ridden on, never, never had any burdens on. And, and donkeys... Can we say they have a unique personality? They can be a little bit of a cantankerous animal. They're, 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 not, they're not something you just walk up to and it's going to want you to pet it and, and get along nice. If anybody else had tried to hop on this donkey's back, he would have been off in a second and, and, and had been kicked at and snorted and all these sorts of things. But once again, this shows Christ's power. I like how it's described in Psalms 8. If we turn back to Psalms 8, verses 6 through 8. Psalm 8, 6. This is speaking of Christ. Thou hast made him to, to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Christ's in charge of the animals, just as, as he's in charge of us. Again, he is Lord of all. So because the Lord was going to ride this donkey, the donkey was going to listen. And this is a strong contrast to Revelation 19.11 when Christ comes back. Then he's going to be on the war horse. Then he's going to be arrayed and, and, and with his armies. And then he's coming in force and then he's coming to conquer. But here he's meek and lowly presenting himself to his people. So he, he's riding, he approaches the east gate, which is called the Golden Gate today. Like I said, it's all blocked up today, but, but that gave access directly to the temple. He, he'd probably never come this way before because that was kind of a main thoroughfare. He often slipped in by the side door by the sheep gate or, or something like that. But, but now it's the main street, and, and Israel's high, and the, and the Mount of Olives is high, and it's the Kidron Valley between. So as he's riding this donkey... If, if you were in the city, you could have seen what was happening very, very clearly. And he hadn't, like I said before, he, he hadn't broadly made his messianic claims before. Within the disciples, he made that very clear. He told them, and, and they recognized that, but he knew that would be counterproductive. He knew the time was not yet come. His, his whole earthly ministry was, 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 if you will, building his credibility and, and showing there should be no doubt and now his time has finally come where, where, where he's going to, to follow the, the perfectly ordained calendar, the perfectly ordained plan, and he's going to present himself to his people as the Messiah. He's fulfilling the prophecy. He's riding in 
To any who would care to take notice, it would be clear he's saying, I, I, am, I am the Messiah, I am God, and I am here coming to my people. And so the disciples, they, <laughs> they did the best they could. They, they brought the donkey there with him. Uh, in verse 7, they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes and set him thereon. So Christ allowed the disciples to elevate him this once. They set him up. They put him on the donkey. They put their clothes on there to make it as comfortable as possible. Um, and once again, it would be a lot easier to ride in a saddle. They didn't have a saddle. So he's, he's kind of precariously perched on there on this pile of cloaks. But it was their mark of respect for their Lord. And, and it's a little confusing here the way it's, they put their, on them their clothes and they set him there on. That, that he only rode on the colt. The, the mother was just there for the disciples. They needed him, her to, to get the, the yearling there. Christ rode on the colt. They put their clothes and he rode on top of that. So he's, he's on the colt. And he's taking the long journey to the city. Now we see the people's error in verses 8 through 11. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. So this is about a two-mile trek from from the, the Mount of Olives to the east gate of Jerusalem. Donkey's not a racehorse. This would not have been a a speedy procession. This probably could have taken the better part of an hour. So there was time for people to recognize what's going on. And and I said there's two million people of Jerusalem. So if even a fraction came out, there was a lot of people gathering up here. They had a chance to see what was happening. They had a chance to to come and be part of it. And, and, And the multitudes, the scripture often says they thronged him. When I picture it, yeah, there's a bunch of people, but I always kind of picture a bubble around Christ, kind of keeping their respectful distance. And they were, they were right up against him. As we know from the story of the woman who had the issue of blood, that she touched his garments, he said, someone touched me. And the disciples were like, how do you say somebody touched you when there's people jostling all around? Well, likewise, here in the triumphal entry, I just think of people like a parade, everybody's staying on the curb and, and, and a clear street. But here we see... Uh, and the mul- in verse 9, and the multitudes that went before and followed. So, so the people aren't just watching. They're part of the procession here. They're putting down their clothes and, and their palm leaves. And they're all working and, and walking their way together here. There, there were palm trees in the way. So they, they, they cut down the fronds and they, they put them in the way to keep down the dust. And as a mark of respect that, that your animal's too good to be, to be stepping on the bare ground there. But actually, they, the, the cutting down of these palm fronds, it wasn't unusual. They would often do that for the Feast of the Tabernacles. Um, in the ancient, more ancient times, they would have used them to build the, the booths that they stayed in. But then they just, they just kind of did it symbolically. They, they would cut down and carry around one of these palm branches. And, and they would cut it down in part awaiting this moment, that it was a symbol for, that they were ready for their king to come. They were, they were ready to, to honor him. And now they finally get a chance to use it. So as I said in in verse 9, these people are all around him. They're not just standing along the the roadside. They're before and behind. And and this is really, in many ways, a similar procession to a king coming. Maybe a king coming up for his coronation or a conquering king returning. That's what, to to Roman readers, that's what this would have brought to mind. That one of the, the great generals or the emperor comes back to Rome after he's had a great conquest and the throngs of people would be around him and they'd be praising him and throwing down garments in the way. But Christ didn't have most of the trappings. He wasn't riding on a chariot. He didn't have great trumpeters blowing before him. This was strictly spontaneous on the part of the crowd. But once again, Christ, Christ is taking his time. To any who cared to look, it was clear that something was going on. And he was forcing people to a decision point. Forcing people, am I going to join in with this or am I going to stay out? Who is this guy? He, he, he wasn't just going to pass under the radar. He was going to confront people with his person, and they were going to have to make a decision based on that. He was presenting himself fully, and, and they could either join or not. And in verse 9, we see their cry. And the multitudes went before, and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And this is taken from Psalm 118. So let's look at that. Psalm 118, 25 and 26. (laughs) 
Psalm 118.25. Save now, I beseech thee. And that's what Hosanna means. Hosanna means save now or, or please save. It's people crying out for their salvation. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So out of the house of the Lord, they're saying this praise is, is coming forth out of the temple. And many of these people were coming from the temple or, or coming from right near there. And, and the people knew this, and they would often, often shout this as people were coming up to Jerusalem for the feast, especially the Feast of the Tabernacle. They, they would say these to, to the people coming up. And, and, and of course this is messianic, and they would say it looking for the Messiah. And that's what I'm afraid also many... They, they, they knew these verses, they, they knew what they were saying, but I think it was said more in hope than in recognition. I don't think most of them knew for sure that this was the, the, the Messiah, but they were saying, hey, ho hopefully, hey, you, pl please, please bring salvation. And, and, and these, are, these are messianic titles from the Psalms. He was praised as the king in, in their words, but, but they weren't saying, hey, Come save. Come save us from our sins. It, it said right there in, in Psalm, come bring prosperity. That's what the people were looking for. They said, hey, come throw off the yoke of Rome. A and at this time, they, it wasn't like they were under the boot heel. Rome, Rome was not overly oppressive to them. They had a, a, a fair amount of freedom, but nobody likes to have somebody else ruling. So, so they wanted to get rid of Rome. That, that's what the people are calling for. Please, please free us from, from what they saw as this oppression. And Luke makes clear that, that the disciples were the ones who got this going. Not just the twelve, but, but the people that had followed him through his ministry. The, these were kind of the leaders. And, and they had the right motivation. They knew that this was Christ coming in. So, so they were crying out, yeah, they, they, they were making clear that this was the Messiah. But then others just kind of joined in. Others kind of got caught up. Hey, maybe this is the person that's going to set up the kingdom. Maybe this is the person that's going to bring prosperity. Maybe this is the person that's going to throw off Rome. So, so some knew and meant it, some misused it, and, and this is why I kind of called it, I, I called the message crowd noise. I think so many, they just caught up, got caught up in it. And unfortunately, we see that all, all too much today, that people who, who would, under normal circumstances, respect the law, be, be easy to get along with, but what, once people start getting together and, and somebody gets stirred up, and it's infectious, and, and, and that's how we have mobs and riots and these sorts of things, that people under normal circumstances, if you had them on their own, they'd never do such things, but, but just the, the fur of the moment, they, they get caught up in it. And, and, and we're acutely sensitive to that today. P people don't want to miss out. That's what, I mean, this... Regardless, people might have no idea what was going on, but man, there's a big to-do outside. I don't, I don't want to miss out on that. Uh, today we have the acronym FOMO, fear of missing out. B because we're such a connected society, we, we know everything that's going on. Uh, man, something goes on, I don't want to be asleep for that, I don't want to miss out on that. So I'm afraid that's why so many of these people were there. Yes, the core were his disciples, the core were the country folk who had followed his ministry, and they knew what they were saying, but so many else were just... Man, that's something to go be part of. I'm, I'm going to go. And well, everybody else is shouting, yeah, I'll, I'll say the same thing. And, and, and that was God's will. God wanted Christ to be loudly proclaimed. But I think people shouted it without really, really understanding. And we see how crowds are fickle. That they were led by the disciples now. And God was using this crowd to his purpose now. To proclaim Christ to be the Messiah. But... Many of these same crowds would follow different leadership later in the week, that the, the religious leaders would get a hold of them. And these, many of these same people would be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. It was an impressive sight, I'm sure, to see Christ coming in with all these people, but many of them were not his followers. And that's why it's important when we're looking at ministries, when we're looking at success, it's not all about how many people we bring in. Yes, it, it's great to reach people with the word, but many ministries might have people go in and, and then they're like this crowd, that they'd be ready to say crucify him by Thursday or Friday. We need to look at the impact of changed hearts. We need to look at the impact of changed lives, changed communities, when we're seeing what is our work doing for the Lord. So Christ entered Jerusalem. He's got these great crowds with him. In verse 10, and when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who was this? 
the, the welcoming crowd, that was a lot of the country people. So the, these people, if they weren't his disciples, they at least had some knowledge of who Christ was. But now he gets into the city, and, and the people are stirred up. I mean, man, this is a big crowd coming in. They're yelling, they're shouting, and, and they're saying, what's going on? I'm sure many of the people that had followed him in, come in with him, that they had either seen or, or they knew about him raising Lazarus. So they, so they knew this was a special guy here, whether or not they knew he was Christ. But so many of the, uh, the people in the city, they, they, they hadn't paid attention. They hadn't followed all these things. They didn't know what was going on. And, and in our connected world today, it's amazing to us to think that people didn't know about him. If, if somebody was going around healing lepers and, and healing the blind and raising the, the dead and the sick, you'd hear about it. But that's just, the, the communication was not that way back then. So these, many of these people, they never heard of, of Jesus and it's especially the Roman leaders. It wasn't the religious leaders. They knew all about him, and they knew what was going on. And we'll look at that in a second. But, but the, the Roman leadership of Rome, they had no idea, and many of the dwellers there. So, and I think they were a little nervous at first. Who's this guy that's got these great big crowds coming in here? They, they wanted a little bit more information. And then when they got it, and they said, well, who's... And I mean no respect to Christ, but to them, who's this guy from the north? He doesn't have any army with him. He doesn't have a horse or anything. He's nothing for us to worry about. So, so basically, they had their, their worries soothed. They're, they're more or less like, what's all the communication about? The commotion. But, but again, Christ, Christ made a commotion that this one time. He made it clear who he was, that he was coming into the city, and, and people had, had to, nobody missed the memo. Everybody had to make a choice. But to me, kind of the, the this is all a great big buildup. Christ, Christ is here in Jerusalem but then we see, what did the people really think about him in verse 11? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. This is where we see the, the true heart and knowledge of most of the people. And, and they were right, he was a prophet. And, and some people read a, a messianic part of that, that there is somebody called, Christ is called the prophet in Deuteronomy. And, and based on the rest of the scripture, I don't think that's what they were getting at. They say, he's, he's a prophet, he's speaking for God. And he's the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And this is where they really show their prejudice because it's, it's common in the Bible and other speakers of that time. Nothing good came out of Nazareth. That, that, that was not the place you wanted to be from. So he's a prophet. He's from Nazareth of Galilee. He's, he's a small town up there. He's, he, there's a reason you never heard of him. That, that's where he's from. And so there's, not, there's nothing about him. He, there's no, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Nothing like that. He, he's the prophet Jesus of Nazareth. They'd been blinded by the lives of the religious leaders and their own sin. They saw Christ. He's a miracle worker. He, he puts on a, a good show. He's, he's really something to see. And, and, and we've looked at the prophecy to anybody that would have paid attention and cared to listen. He's obviously presenting himself as Christ, but the people, their, their own hardness of heart ha, has led them to miss that. And, and, and God has, has blinded them, but judicial blinding, God causing blindness is often caused by, by us choosing that, that, that we choose to be blind in our own sin. That's what happened to the people. That's what happened. The religious leaders, they, they could see it all. They knew what he was claiming, but by their own sin, they'd harden their hearts, and therefore God allows them to go forward in that and hardens them as well. So they refuse to acknowledge him for who he is and who he's claiming to be. The religious leaders knew exactly, though, what he was saying. We see that in John 12, 9. The last passage we'll look at, John 12, 19. And, and we really see the, the focus of the apostles when you look at where we are. That We're down to Christ last week, and in Matthew we've got... Six more chapters. John, we're not even halfway through the book when he's in his triumphal entry because the focus of Christ's life, it's not on the miracles, it's not on the ministry, it's about his death. In John 12, 19, after he has made his triumphal entry, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how we prevail nothing. Behold, the whole world is gone after him. They saw the people praising. They thought all is lost. Man, they knew Christ was claiming to be Messiah. And they saw the people follow. And they thought their cause was lost. They knew they needed to act quickly. They knew they needed to turn Rome against him and turn the people against him. And this is really all what it boils down to in verse 11 here. 
is that the people missed the point. They might have been part of the crowd. They might have seen Jesus come in. But I would say the majority didn't own him as Lord. They didn't recognize him as the Messiah, as God in the flesh. And that's a problem we have very, very acutely today. There's so many people, Jesus, yeah, he's, he, he was a great teacher. He, he was a prophet. He had a lot of good things to say. Uh, there, there's the famous Thomas Jefferson Bible. that he, he liked what Jesus had to say about morals, but all those miracles and stuff, that didn't really suit him. So he, he cut all that out and, and, and just left Jesus' words. And, and that's what people want today. They want to call him Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. He had some nice things to say. He, he, he was a good example to us. But, but that doesn't cut it. If that's all we know about Christ, then, then we're as bad as the Jews that, that called for his death. That you, you've, you've, missed the, you've missed the main point. This is Jesus the Christ. This is the virgin-born Son of God. This is not just the King of Israel. This is the King of kings come to earth. He offered himself to his people. He came unto his own. He came into his own city. He came unto his own people. And his own received him not. They rejected him. Today, he, 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 he keeps coming to heart's doors. As the gospel is proclaimed, people hear. The Holy Spirit prompts and the Holy Spirit says, this is Jesus Christ. Respond. Receive him. And people are still saying no. As the week wore on, the, the crowds were probably looking around. When's it going to happen? When's he going to throw off Rome? When's the kingdom going to be set up? And it didn't come. I would say, as, as far as these cheering crowds were concerned, this ended up in a loss. In, in sports, sporting events, man, it's a tight game and, and, and there's a chance to win it and, and the place is electric and, the, and people are shouting and, and then the field goal's missed or the, or the goal and it doesn't happen. And then, as they describe it, the air just goes out of the building and everybody's silent. I think that's what happened to the crowd here. They were all charged up and then their expectations were not met. And then, well, he, he didn't save us. Rome's still here. He, he, didn't, he didn't come and conquer. Well, what's the big deal? Now there's silence. There's no enthusiasm and then they turn on him. They said, well, well you, you didn't do what, you, what we thought you were going to do. You didn't, you didn't save us from Rome. You didn't bring prosperity. And so now the crowd turns. The crowd turns into a mob. And then as we're going to talk about Good Friday, crucify him, crucify him. His people asked for the death of their Messiah. In this story, in, in, this, in this narrative, we see how Christ followed the Father's plan to the smallest detail. There, there was nothing too little to be overlooked. He didn't get the wrong animal. He, he, he didn't go in the wrong gate. It was all laid out and he followed it to the smallest detail. And he followed it in humility. What a great lesson to us as we go out that, that God doesn't just tell us the broad strokes. He, he's got specific things he wants done and we need to listen. We need to do the little things right and we need to do it in humility. The disciples likewise got... Christ gave him an awfully strange request just to go in and take somebody's donkey. But they, they listened to Christ. They followed him, and he took care of the details. With the example of Christ, who are we to refuse any task? Who are we to say, well, that's too menial, that's too small, I don't have time for that? Who are we to do that? Who are we to be prideful of what we accomplish or, or to think that we've really arrived, to think that we're really something? And as he entered, the, the crowds, man, they looked impressive. It really seemed like he was having an impact here. They were yelling his praises, but they soon turned on him. And that's something we've got to be careful about. Do we turn on God when he doesn't fulfill our expectations? Are we all about him here on Sunday morning? Yeah, praise the Lord. I've got a need. Hey, bring salvation. Hosea, Lord, save me from this. And then it doesn't work out. And then, then do we get bitter? We say, Lord, why'd you let that happen? Why didn't you take care of this situation in my life? Why didn't you let that work out? And then when we look at, at, at our, our ministry or our churches or look, look at other ministries, do we just look on the exterior appearance? Do we look at numbers and say, man, he draws a big crowd. Man, they've really got a lot of people there. That, that evangelist, man, he's filling stadiums there. That, that must be really where it's at. Or do we judge on the impact that are had on lives and hearts and communities? And most importantly, when we look at Christ, who do we see? Do we see Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth and Galilee? Or do we see Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the King of kings, the
the Lord of Lords. We've seen Christ's plan of entrance. He was going to come this final time in Jerusalem and offer himself as the Messiah. We've seen the prophetic explanation, how all this was, was very clearly foretold, and how Christ fulfilled it to the smallest detail, but was rejected. And that's why the kingdom being set up, that's why the salvation did not follow, because they rejected him. We saw the people's error, that they didn't want this, they didn't want this meek and humble king. They wanted somebody that was going to come in force. So they missed out on who Christ was. So I ask you this morning, do you use Christ's humility as an example in your own life? Are you as humble as Christ? If you are asked to come in and ride the donkey, don't ride the war horse, are you willing to do that? And where is your focus today? When you're looking to God, are you looking for him to save you from your Rome? Are you looking, Lord, take care of these physical needs. Bring me prosperity. Bring me health and wealth and success and all these sorts of things. Or are you looking at your spiritual need first? Are you recognizing that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of salvation? And even as believers, we need to come back and realize I've fallen short, Lord. I need you to make me more like you. We don't get saved and that's taken care of and then we just look, God, please shower your blessings upon me. We come back and say, Lord, I know that you died on the cross for me and cover my sins and you enable me to walk in the newness of life. Please Please strengthen me and help me to do that. Are you like the crowds that you're, you know what you're supposed to say, your mouth and the words, and, and it's, it sounds good, but, but does it come from the heart? Is your praise genuine as you seek to be more like our Lord, to be more humble, to take up your cross daily and follow him? That's not, we're not just called at salvation, take up your cross and go but, but if we're to be like Christ, we need to take up that cross daily in that measure of humility, in that measure of, of submission to God and follow him. Is that where your life is at today? And I'm, we, we all have room for improvement. I pray, as we go in prayer here, ask the Lord, where, where is this pride sticking into my life? Lord, where am I telling you no, thinking something is beneath me? Lord, where am I not impressed enough with, with what Christ did for me? What area of my life have I not allowed that to to, to just percolate through. As we looked last week at, at, at Christ, who is, who is humble to death, even the death of the cross, when we truly come before what he did for us, it's going to change our lives, not just at salvation, but in our Christian life. As we know more about who Christ is and what he did, it should make us more like him. Will you pray for that with me this morning? Let's go to the Lord. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for... Palm Sunday, Lord, we just thank you for, for your triumphal entry that you are the Messiah. Regardless that your people rejected you, we know that doesn't change who you are. We know that you're coming again and you will come in power. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But Lord, we thank you that you came as a man. That, that you know all of our struggles, all of our problems. We thank you that you came in humility. You were humble enough to die for us, but Lord, we pray that we would have that same degree of humility. Lord, please help us to not look down on any task, to look down on any ministry. Whatever your will is for us, that we would, be, we would be willing to just say yes. We would be willing to fulfill that to the fault, smallest detail. Praise Lord that our, our prayer and praise would be genuine, that we just wouldn't get caught up in the crowd on Sundays and, 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 and say nice things to you, but from the deepest part of our being, that we would worship you, that we would praise and thank you. If there's anyone here, Lord, that they still only see you as Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee, I pray that your Holy Spirit would touch them today to show them that you are Christ. You are God incarnate and that you have died to save lost sinners, that you have paid the price and that you offer salvation from their sin. I pray that they would come to know you in that way today, Lord. And to believers, I pray that each of us would just have a deeper knowledge, a deeper vision of you on the cross and that we would take up our cross daily and follow you in a closer way. Please guide and direct us and always say and do, Lord. We love you and ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen.